Awesome. This is the OGM Thursday check-in call for Thursday, December 9th, 2021. We're coming to the end of 2021, which seems very strange. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, I can't believe it. I mean, this has just been flying by. Whoosh. <laughs> an odd thing. Um, I did an interview with Jesse Engel in Venice, California a couple of days ago. And he was in uh, like a museum type space that had been curated by a fellow for 35 years. And it was really like, it was really cool. It's just a beautiful space. We should all live in museums. Yeah. Or we just you know, put an image behind us. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what, made me, uh, what made me think about it exactly. Um, hey, Doug. Hey, Pete. Um, nice to see everybody. Uh, so why don't we, well, first uh, a couple check-ins on weaving the world and so forth. And uh, I have, there's a couple of things I haven't quite figured out yet. <laughs> Yesterday we spent a bunch of time because April is about to travel slightly internationally. She has a speaking engagement in the Bahamas, believe it or not, in person. And we're being cautious, et cetera, et cetera. But she needs uh, COVID negative test confirmation in apparently a QR code. So she went and took a COVID test at Kaiser passed, got an email that says, click here to get your QR code. That link has bonked for the last three days. We have a tech support issue in. Kaiser says, oops, our website is broken there. We don't know what's wrong. So no, like, no QR code and nobody can, nobody can like paint the dots in by hand to figure out like to, to replace that QR code. And we don't know what's going to, and, and the problem is not so much showing up at the airport and flashing something. The problem is she needs to get a visa. Or she needs to email the confirmation to, uh, the Bahamas to get the visa. So then there's another program through emed.com where you can get them to ship you uh, a box of test kits. And the, the Binax test kit, there's two versions. There's the home test kit, which we bought a couple months ago and used once, uh, which is fine, but doesn't work for travel. And then there's another kind that you, they say, like, don't open it. Uh, you call in, you talk to a, a representative on video, they watch you open it. There's sort of this kind of chain of custody-ish kind of thing for it. And then that result is actually valid and can be used for travel. Uh, and at least United America and a couple airlines accept it. Okay, good. Except they haven't actually shipped the box and they can't even tell us where the box is. And they appear, their back office appears to be a, a, a torrid mess. So that's plan B. Uh, and anyway, long story short, we have like plan E right now. Uh, and April doesn't actually fly until Saturday, but today she's doing a, a day trip uh, and isn't really available. So it's kind of messy. Um, that aside, uh, that's kind of a reason why uh, I, have, I haven't picked dates yet for composting calls, but um, Weaving the World, just by way of check-in, um, hey Stuart, um, Weaving the World is, uh, we basically have, by the end of this week, we'll have four episodes of raw materials in hand. And then uh, Pete and I principally and anybody else who'd like to help will be turning these into episodes of a podcast. And then I'm going to book uh, date, uh, basically times for uh, what we're thinking of as composting calls to go back and watch the same, watch the, the calls and go back into the topics of those calls and weave them together and invite other mappers and other kinds of things. So the first four episodes are um, I think the first one will be my interview with Jesse Engel that I just did. So we're going to produce that and put it up uh, in raw form. Uh, they have a soft launch uh, on the 15th of December. So I'll do that uh, in the next day or so. Um, then we have two episodes of these calls. The two, the, the call we did on the metaverse and then the call we did on the betterverse last Thursday were really terrific. And I don't think we'll take the full calls, but we're going to figure out a, a chunk of those calls and make those episodes of Weaving the World. And that means that I'll put a, an intro and an outro around them to say, this is what, what, what's going on, et cetera. They'll have pages on the weavingtheworld.org website. There'll be a page for each episode, all that kind of thing. And then this afternoon, I'm interviewing uh, Daryl Davis, who's one of my heroes, uh, who is a black jazz musician who has the garage full of KKK robes. And I friended him on LinkedIn. He was very nice and he, he just traveled back from Berlin uh, and so the, the time that worked for him was 5 p.m. today. So I'm, I'm going to uh, talk with him on the call. And then 
the plan is for future interviews like that not to be just me, but to be an invite into the OGM community for whoever wants to show up. But this one, just to keep things as simple as possible and to do the simplest thing that could possibly work, uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep it uh, pretty simple at that at that rate. But but that'll mean there'll be four really nice uh, pieces of content that we can then uh, manually step through uh, what it is we think we're doing uh, to post process these calls. Right. And so, so, so I do some pre-processing anyway, because I've got Daryl Davis has been in my brain for years. Uh, I've watched a couple of his Ted talks. I read the article by Nick Kristoff, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with his work and approach. Um, I watched a documentary about him and his work. Uh, so I do some pre-work, uh, then during the call, there's some work, but then after the call, what do we do about what got said? How do we deepen? How do we complexify to use Adam Grant's language? <clears throat> and that was part of what I think Rob was saying on the OGM list this morning is like, hey, this isn't so simple. There's sort of complexity here. And I, I think that that exploring that complexity together in visual and other kinds of, of forms is really important is kind of the work that we're doing for creating shared context or shared meaning. Um, that was a lot of stuff. So let me hit pause and see if anybody has any comments or thoughts or questions on, on what I just said. That was perfectly clear. Awesome. Um, and so if, you, if you're interested, there's a channel for Weaving the World Operations. There's a channel on Mattermost if you want to tune into uh, what we're doing and what's up and, and participate. Um, we're going to kind of go all sorts of different places with that. And, um, and uh, it feels really exciting. I'm like, you know, what, what we to take a lot of what we do and deepen it and then make it more public and more useful and more visible in different ways. Um, so let's go to our check-in format. And how about uh, Klaus, Eric, Wendy for starters? Again, yeah, it has been busy. I've been gone for a while because uh, it, it just has been really busy, but uh, um, there's no no real way to to regulate your time. So we have, you know, we, we've had lots of discussions about um, the innovation spoker, you know, and uh, finally we got, uh, I mean, I was able to put my hands on a project that sort of proves con is proof of concept for the idea of innovation spoker. And so this group that I joined, Planetary Care, um, they had developed <clears throat> a relationship with um, with what we call you know, a, a local champion, which is the chief operating officer of a group of 30 farmers, a co-op of 30 farmers, uh, which is Shepherd's Crane. Um, fairly successful guys, but uh, um, really looking to, to reinvent themselves. And so when, when we uh, were able to, to work with um, someone local, we were able to set up meetings with Washington State University, with extensions, but then also with the entire uh, community of uh, Food Hub and, and Co-op and, and so on. And we came back with uh, a very enthusiastic um, um, invitation you know, to, to keep moving. And that's what we're doing. So right now, the, uh, our local guy is working to sign up farmers and these are big guys. I mean, they're the average size farm is 3,300 acres. Um, so when he started signing up a group of farmers, we know already of five who want to set up demonstration farms somewhere between 50 and 150 acres each and just test something completely new, perennial grains, you know, integrated livestock, agroforestry, silvopasture, um, just from ground on up, re reinvent, you know, their farming operation. Um, and so you now we developed, uh, uh, we, we had to on the fly, you know, develop on who are we and what are we doing. And so we positioned ourselves as strategic consultants um, to, uh, to first of all, uh, guide the development of a uh, master plan for, for the entire group. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, 
and then uh, uh, find uh, and, and then activate the entire community. And the Palouse is the largest grain growing region in North America, millions of acres of land. Um, our group has 150,000 acres between them. Um, so 90% of their of their products are getting exported. Uh, so, it, it, so this is a, a huge potential you know, to, to uh, scale to make impact at scale. Um, but we also you know, we're also really interested in working with the uh, uh, NGO groups you know, in the community. So with the food hub, with the farmers market, and all of that. Um, and so we developed, you know, I, I posted a mind map um, uh, yesterday, I, I'll post it in, in a moment, but Gene Bellinger joined our team. Um, and, you know, Gene is like a master systems designer. Um, he's using Kumo, <laughs> which is not, it's a different program, but Kumo really is, is a mind mapping tool. Um, doesn't have pod applications. It's not something you can send out uh, for people to know what you're doing, but it helps you to structure the, the relationships you're looking to connect. And this is really sort of the core thing is to help people find each other. When, when you start getting into, into this space, um, you find there's a lot of people who um, want to connect. A farmer wants to connect you know, with a guy who, who knows about uh, micronutrients and the guy with micronutrients wants to find a farmer who's willing to test and and use it so we're basically becoming this brokerage function you know where we are connecting uh, uh, functions and people together so it's exciting um, and uh, and at the same time super superbly intimidating <laughs> because i mean we don't have any money right so we we, we have to figure that there's no revenue model that i can identify at this point so we have to um, so we'll we'll end up needing help on a lot of on a lot of levels, you know, things that I haven't done before because I'm a corporate guy, you know, I haven't set up companies, I haven't done uh, any of that stuff. But uh, so anyway, huge potential and um, and Jerry, you know, you have been uh, uh, superbly helpful to get us to the place where we're in right now because it has been a journey uh, for you know, several years now. So. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before I go to Gil, I just have a couple of questions. And and Klaus, it's it's exciting to watch this all form up. Um, one specific question, which is, I think in the conversations online, I saw that sort of livestock slaughter facilities would be really useful. Like we're one of the top priorities. And I remember from uh, might have been Omnivore's dilemma or somewhere else. Uh, one of the really interesting farms that was doing sort of uh, livestock rotation and grass growing and all of that. Uh, said, we slaughter our own chickens because we can, we can't slaughter our own cattle because of laws, because whatever, whatever. And, and it, it, it pointed directly towards sort of livestock facilities. But then I thought uh, there seemed to be institutional, governmental, regulatory blockages to do that, to just go set something up. And I'm wondering, you know, if, uh, if uh, the freelancers union in New York uh, unifies freelancers to create a group of people for collective bargains on insurance shopping, for example, health insurance. Is there some interesting organizational structure, and I might be overthinking this, that could allow uh, slaughtering facilities to actually exist as shared fractional ownership as some other thing that passes the sniff test for current regs, but still allows this to then be like really, really accessible? Because it might, it, uh, that's the kind of thing that feels a little bit like a game changer uh, in that setting. And yeah, there's a massive opportunity because right now smallholder farmers can't get their animals into the market because they can't get into facilities that are USDA approved and that is the requirement to get into the wholesale market. Right? Right. <clears throat> and, and this market has been so corrupted, there are basically four companies that dominate the entire market and, and basically screw the farmers you know, in, in, in the process. And, and prevent you know, smaller farmers from competing. It's an important cash flow opportunity for a small farmer you know, to get your chickens and your pigs and so on. And you can feed those animals basically for free you know, with waste products that are happening on the farm. So I had a conversation with the leader of the uh, Washington State University extensions in the Palouse region already. And, um, 
there, there are ways to, to work around these limitations by using a truck mounted uh, slaughter facilities. So you go right into the field and process the animal right in the field. That means you don't need to develop uh, you know, a facility with all the complications and zoning regulations and so on. And then you bring the animal to a central processing facility where it gets cut and processed you know, into the freezer and so on. So there, there is that, and it, it allows uh, the development of a modular capacity. So you, you, you get as many trucks as you need because these farmers are going to ramp up with their animals. And you can't build a facility that is big enough to, 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 to hold future capacity as you may need uh, because then, then your numbers get all tangled up. So we already talked with some investors because that could be a national thing, right? I mean, we could build uh, the capacity for this kind of, of uh, uh, modular design and just factory build these things and ship them out. You know? So, so they are absolutely these. Another opportunity is, is the, which is uh, often overlooked is micronutrients. And that is really coming on strong. So the industry wants to uh, uh, coat seeds with micronutrients. And the question is, why would you do that? Just let the farmer use his own seeds and then pull your own micronutrients with waste products, basically, you know, that you have uh, on the farm. And, so, and that could totally replace synthetic nitrogen fertilizer and would revolutionize again. I mean, those two things would be total game changers. Uh, and so we are, we are going to develop uh, a, uh, a prototype in the Peru's for those two things, and then hopefully um, set that up for application. Love that. And also, I think Kevin's been working a lot with non-forest timber products, or sorry, non-timber forest products. Uh, so things like right. mushrooms and medic medications and other sorts of things that if you're, grant if you're heading toward agroforestry and all that, there's probably a lot of uh, Interesting leverage there. Go ahead, Kevin. Definitely, definitely. So, so one workaround, one of the most uh, um, simple ways, you know, to reduce beef consumption is to plant hamburgers with, with mushrooms. Uh, it tastes fantastic. You know, it's protein rich, you know, yeah. nutrient rich, and so on. Um, that, so, it's a from a nutritional perspective and from an environmental perspective, uh, it's just an easy thing to do. So yeah, we already have one one farmer interested in in setting up uh, uh, mushroom production. Yeah, you, you're muted. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, go ahead. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, we're working. Uh, we've got a 600 acre camp uh, near us, and uh, we're working on the whole initiative called Outdoors for All. So it's related to our community equity fund. That's working on you know finding outdoors is is like this our biggest industry and it, and it ranges from tourism to healing uh, and black folks don't have businesses in it. And so we've got this streets to peaks program as one example. And a kid from Charlotte from the hood uh, came to the camp and realized that I want to be uh, like a farmer, like a mushroom farmer. And so we are starting to incubate some businesses there and non-timber forest products are things that, will let you do, you can't do regenerative forestry without non-timber forest products because there's no reason the people shouldn't chop down the trees. So pine resin is a big example, but you know, biomedicinals that grow in the understory, uh, you know, um, arnica and <clears throat> black cohosh grows a lot around here and it's a great thing for women's menopause. And actually we're, we're able to uh, work with a, a lab here at a forestry lab that is able to uh, spawn things that are only wild harvested. Uh, and so wild harvest is really decimating, uh, you know, ginseng especially, but uh, the environment, while well, people do that. And, and it's, you know, folks in single wides going out hunting, hunting the thing, you know, it's, it's a redneck kind of thing that then they sell in, up into she she things in Brooklyn. It's really kind of a weird supply chain. And uh, we're, but with spawning, we can, you know, we help people uh, pay the taxes on their land and fight off the tourism gentrifiers. And so we, we were got an incubation there and we're raising some money around and doing an event called Outdoor, uh, Investing in Outdoors for All. Outdoors for All, you can also think of it as, you know, black folks in the woods, y'all, here we come. <clears throat> because it, one of the things with displacement is that people of color weren't allowed to think that they could be part of the outdoors. It was a place they didn't go and they were told they didn't go. And 
it's also, you know, here where they got moved, a whole community got moved for the Biltmore of the Shilohs. We're building this repair tax. But outdoors for all is, is a pretty interesting thing. And biomedicinals, uh, you know, mushrooms are, are the easiest thing to, to grow, but we're doing all, all these other kinds of things. We're oddly the most biodiverse place we find with Yucatan, on, which is the most, but it's amazing uh, how, how biodiverse this place is. So biomedicinals tied into, you know, crystals and massage and shit like that and hiking is, is kind of our industry here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an all white place. So we're, we're working on that. And together it makes an economy. So that's great. Love that. Um, yeah. Gil, Gil, you've been really patient. Please jump in. Yeah, see if I can remember what I can remember. Um, Klaus, first of all, huge congratulations. Uh, I'm really, uh, really excited about what you've been up to and your perseverance on it and it's starting to take fruit. Couple of questions. Oh, and the, the, the mobile slaughterhouse thing sounds really important because it's very difficult to have a truly regenerative agriculture without animals in the loop. Um, and so making that possible is really important. Um, you, start, you sort of answered one of my questions when you said there is no revenue model. So I'm curious about what your relationship, what your business relationship is with the farmers. So we have um, a meeting, not we, have, we started a standing uh, Monday meeting. Um, and so in this coming Monday, we will find out how many farmers have signed up. And the, the, our contact from Shepherd's Crane is reaching out to other farmers. Mm -hmm. And I told them the, bigger, the more, the better, right? The more, the bigger we can make this, the easier it will be to attract uh, resources. Um, and then we are, we are already saying we are positioning ourselves as your consultants, right? So we'll represent you. So then, the, you know, I mean, right now uh, they have indicated they may be willing to chip in some donations, basically, you know, so we use uh, Jordan's uh, 501c3 mm -hmm. to generate some money. To, I mean, we need, we need bridge money, right? We need to have like three, four months or so covered because I need to hire people. I need to hire a project manager. Uh, we need to hire uh, a, 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 a relations person who schedules meetings mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And so there's like three or four positions we need to bring on and we have to pay these people. And we need to have a grant writer, for example, right? I mean, uh, the, this is not just going to happen. So that's so that's sort of where we are. So we need to find you know, uh, some breathing space to, to, to give us time to think. And and uh, and uh, develop and develop you know, the capacity to apply for grants and uh, for and, and and set up a credible relationship with investors, because the in what 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 you see everywhere is the understanding of what is an innovation broker is just not there. I mean, the value that you're providing has no material value, right? No. So when you when you see on the other side, no, it has material value, it just doesn't have a form for capturing. And exactly. transacting that value, the value is huge. Let's be yeah. clear. So I want I want to I want to offer a provocation, and I and I'm hesitant to do this because I don't know the, all the details on the ground. But I think a a a, 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 a a business relationship with the farmers at some point seems really key. And the two best ways I've seen that happen: one is that the the grain company provides it as a built-in service. Uh, which may be a possibility in the future. But the other that's most interesting to me: uh, I met a uh, Years ago, I met a farm advisor working out of the Fresno area named Ibrahim Michael, and um, he had a very different approach than most of the farm advisors. Most of them charged a per acre fee, um, you know, X dollars per acre per season, uh, and they were incentivized in their business model to prescribe agricultural chemicals, which they would make money selling. It's, you know, it was a nasty thing. Um, Ibrahim said, <clears throat> offered the same kind of service, non-chemical, and said to the farmers, you pay me at the end of the season what you think I was worth. Courageous, you know. Um, That's about where we are. <laughs> and, and, and what he found was that he, he averaged about double the per acreage fee than what the chemical salesman farm advisors would charge. Now, you may not be ready for that. But think about that. I mean, think about what's the relationship where the value gets realized and recognized and transacted in some kind of fair to all way. Uh, I'm just concerned if you try to build this on a philanthropic model, uh, I don't think it's gonna have roots and I'm concerned if, whether it would scale. And so, you know, finding a way to, and it may take a while. You may have to go, you may have to step into it for the farmers to recognize the value, but you also may just actually talk about that with them at the start because these, these folks are business people. 
uh, yeah. of some of the most rigorous and smartest kind in the world and say, look, here's the deal. We're going to bring you stuff. It's going to be valuable. You may not know that it is now or may not believe that it is now. What can we construct? It will be fair to you given the risk that you're, that, that you're taking on us and fair to us given the effort that we're putting in with you. And I just encourage you to look into that direction. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk with you more if you, if, if you want. The, the other thing is, I, I may have mentioned to you before, a guy, guy named Ed Hooling back on the East Coast, who's doing a similar kind of play in a very different agricultural ecosystem, um, as well as, um, what's his name, H-U-L-I-N-G, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, as well as Walter Yenny, who we've talked about before, J-E-H-N-E, who's doing similar work in Australia. Um, uh, Hooling's been able to get some significant support for his work, and so if you're not connected with those guys, you might want to hook up with them and compare notes and see where it can go. I'll send you a note, Gil. Maybe you can help me. Happy to do I that. Totally appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, this is not my skill set, right? I mean, I'm a strategist, you know, so I figure out stuff and, and one, stay one step ahead of where we're going. But there are a lot of moving parts here that yeah. uh, I haven't done before. Well, you've, you've, you've done pretty well for not being your skill set. You're moving a lot of parts. And we want parts, and and actually, there's parts of your skill set that are very relevant. They may may just not look like it, but I think there are. So, uh, anyhow, big big congratulations, and thank yeah. you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, Klaus, uh, Wendy. Yeah, Klaus, so exciting to hear what's going on for you, um, and it just made me think. And I think there's some other people here who may know more than I do, but I I keep. If you're looking for funding and you're looking to match up and looking for grants and things, I know Open Futures Coalition is doing a lot um, to try to match projects and funding. Um, that is, I've just started connecting with them and that's not, the, I'm connecting with them on an area of, of wisdom repositories and things. So I haven't learned a lot about what they're curating, uh, but they just uh, launched a platform that's in its, you know, alpha, alpha, alpha. So it would be about uh, talking to the uh, Jamaican Jamaica Stevens, who's who's uh, facilitating that that group, and seeing if maybe there's a connection there for you. Yeah, we just had a meeting with them this week. This Mary in, uh, in, in Jamaica. Yeah, um, yeah. So so we, we are we are we are on. I mean, there is the American Sustainable Business Network. There's Open Impact. I mean, there's a number of groups you know that are active in this in this field. But they're all they're all in various stages of piloting. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking in terms of you getting support from a group of people who are already making the efforts to identify sources of funding, right? Might might facilitate. So I'm glad you connected with them. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, let's go, Eric, Wendy, Stewart. Okay. Hi, everybody. So first, uh, some comments for Klaus. Um, so I live in Pennsylvania and near Lancaster, there's a, I saw a model of an Amish farm and I'm just wondering, like the looking at Amish, if there is something there about how they work their farm or live with, without electricity essentially. And then also um, Temple Grandin has done a lot of research on humane slaughterhouses. So just passing that on in case you haven't looked at any of this. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, can I just take the screen for a second here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. all yours, go ahead. Um, so, so here is this uh, Kumo map that we developed. And, uh, and just, just so for ourselves, you know, to, to, to uh, figure this, but we, are, we have a meeting with Google X on Friday tomorrow, actually. And, and so we'll be using this to explain this. So here's planetary care. Um, and so we are developing this, this, uh, this relationship here with Shepherd's Crane, right? So here's Shepherd's Crane um, and they are setting up demonstration farms uh, and we need all these uh, resources for the demonstration farms. Shepherd's Crane needs additional resources because bionutrients, for example, slaughterhouse capacity, goes beyond the demonstration farm. Those are capacities that would have to be developed uh, directly with, with the co-op. They have to make a call if that's you know, what they want to do. So then, then here we're developing uh, contacts with research institutions and government. Uh, so we are in the process of developing names and we already have you know, a bunch of names here. The other one then is commercial entities. So here we, we, we give um, an opportunity for 
uh, companies that are in this regenerative space you know, and, and come in with innovative uh, products that are, that are game changers in the industry. And we are connecting them you know, through planetary care, we are connecting them with Shepherd's Crane, where and how that makes sense. So then what you're talking about now, this is community development. Um, and so in community development, uh, we already have, know there is a, uh, uh, a member-owned uh, co-op that's really incredible in the Palouse. Now there's a local food hub, uh, local currencies on the table, catering organizations, like we already talked with the uh, catering director from Washington State University, they're serving 10,000 meals a day. Um, and so, and we talked with the chef, so can you adapt your menus you know, to take local sourcing and so on? Farmer's market, there's big opportunities through the farmer's market to get the uh, two, uh, two for one, uh, the double your food bug program going and roll that out into the community. So this year is totally in nonprofit work, right? So we, we, the best we can hope for here is to get a grant. But this is sort of my passion, I mean, here, because this is the base of, uh, uh, of pyramid economy, which is you know, the most needy part and, and, and the most impactful part. And the Palouse is perfect here because uh, there is about 68,000 people living in the Palouse. The biggest city is 20,000, it's Moscow. Um, lots of small communities of 1,000, 2,000 people. You know, it's Trump land. You know, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful place to engage and, and help people help themselves, right? So, so this is how we, this is how we, uh, you know, and, and Gene, of course, Gene Ballinger helped us uh, develop this. So to, to thought, to, you know, focus our thoughts and, and, uh, and, and develop a structure that will help us, you know, plan out the organizational construct. Um. And Thank since you. we're back with you, Klaus, for a second, I'll interrupt Eric just for a second, if I may. Um, I, I put two questions up earlier, which uh, which were, um, do you have an outside conversational technology for communicating with the farmers and with you in the group, whether it's WhatsApp or a mail list or anything? Like, is there a consistent place where you're talking together, like our Mattermost chat or whatnot? Um, and oh, then, gosh. and that's really easy to set up, like like a WhatsApp or a Telegram group would work because chances are far farmers are usually a little technologically astute because they gotta be. Um, and then the second thing was, is there any way you're creating some institutional memory to put it outboard? Like the Kumu diagram would be great living on a baby website of some sort that where you can start sharing what you know, because it occurs to me that as you invent stuff and figure stuff out, this replicates very nicely, adaptably, any place anybody wants resources to figure out what to do on the ground. And you're then inventing the innovation broker role as you do this work right now. But the innovation brokers need resources to share and a place to point to the resources like, hey, look over here, right? So I'm wondering if, if, you're, if you're sort of focusing on those pieces, uh, those slightly geeky pieces of the work. At this point, I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> so okay, I mean, we're just flying by the seats of our pants. You know, it, it is. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so th that's that's um, Pete. Over to you. A great question, Jerry. And and um, most organizations, you know, should have that kind of stuff and don't. Um, I there's there's a role that never gets filled, which is kind of um, digital librarian. Uh, collaboration, you know, facilitator kind of thing. Um, I, I think you end up needing to embed one of those or, or partial one of those in, in organizations to get it done. Otherwise, it won't get done. Just, just an observation. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and so, uh, I mean, there's, there's really what I, if I were you to create so I find that a simple conversation tool is like a great thing because people are like, oh my God, we can talk to each other. And you might want to do a, 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 just a straw poll, a simple poll with the people you think you want to have in conversation say, are you all on Telegram or WhatsApp or Google chat? Or what do you use to, to, to normally talk with your family or colleagues? And then just build one of those. Because uh, if they're already in the tool, 80% of your job is done. You just add a group that, that's them talking. And that's really easy. The external, me the, the external memory is a, is a little more work. And it, not that the tools are, are hard to do. But, uh, but anybody, a digital librarian or a curator or somebody who can sort of mind that for you as you're, as you're doing the work would be really like, like cool. And there might be somebody in the OGM community who'd like to play that role in your project just for a while as a volunteer. 
uh, but you need to find a place to, to maybe put stuff. And that's not that hard to do. Um, you could use Massive Wiki. Uh, there's a bunch of other tools as well, but that means you need somebody who's literate in it. Um, Stuart. Yeah, um, pardon, <clears throat> pardon me. Just to pick up on what, what Peter suggested, um, everyone is so kind of inclined to jump into action very, very quickly. And often, and I, and I see class where you're working, there are a lot of collaborations going on and everybody tends to want to continue to move forward without having clarity about what the collaboration is, what people are doing together. Something that I call agreements for results. I'll talk about it a little bit more when, uh, when I check in, but that at some point in time becomes essential. Otherwise you run into problems uh, down the road a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, yeah definitely. It, 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 it's a sequential uh, a process. And I don't, I mean, I'm very conscious of not getting ahead of myself. Uh, and, and also the coop, you know, that, uh, to have our team uh, wanting to jump to you know, a conclusion. And so we are following the theory U model religiously. You know, so we're going down the, the, uh, in the, the, the curve and every time we develop a new contact, that whole line starts up again, right? Um, so until we reach this presencing phase where we're all on the same page. Um, and, and, and then move into crystallizing and prototyping from there. But I'm, I'm very conscious of using, of using that structure. Thank you. And Eric, thank you for tolerating the long interruption. Back to you and your check-in. Okay. I just posted a link in the chat. Um, it's an episode of Connections by James Burke, which is on the Internet Archive. And I've been watching these. They're fascinating. He just traces the trail of things. Uh, okay. So... Um, today is 53 years ago today, Douglas Engelbart gave his mother of all demos. And uh, I watched it this morning, and it's, uh, it's interesting to see uh, what he came up with that um, it, it's groupware and um, outlining and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, um, with that in mind, um, the decentralized web. Um, there was um, a meetup yesterday with the Internet Archive, and um, it was run by Wendy Hanamura, and they used an interesting space called Gather Town. Have people heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I like that because uh, people had their booths set up and you could just walk around and talk to people and find out what they're working on. So um, yeah, I spoke with um, a person I worked with before. He's from, uh, well, they're from Canada and uh, thinking about, um, yeah, the, the, he, they wrote a browser called Agrigor which um, allows you to get at um, un different protocols. Like if you have data in IPFS, uh, well, yeah, interplanetary file system or in the, the hyper core protocol and several others. He now has GUN, which is a graph database and he's working on integrating it with web archiving. So think about that, that you could be browsing for something and download your own web archive of a whole site or pieces of a site and uh, browse it offline. So I think there's going to be something, um, a push towards offline access. Um, so um, I did some writing, just of my thoughts about how Ted Nelson's ideas could um, be brought onto the decentralized web, and I'm going to post a link to that now. So thanks. Eric, thank you. That's a, <clears throat> that's a great bunch of resources. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm so some people are motivated by um, having read Anne Rand's Fountainhead back in the day. Some people are motivated by Cosmos, uh, you know, Carl Sagan. I'm motivated by um, Burke's uh, Connection series. Mm -hmm. So you just posted one of those, and I'm like, yep, yep, yep. That, that's for me that's a lot of how history happens there's the, these adjacencies conjunctions and serendipities that people notice and then build on and we just Excellent. like yep. we're, we're trying to do this right mm -hmm. um fabulous uh, so i've forgotten what queue i had i think i have wendy 
<clears throat> um, Stuart and Julian. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have settled a bit. <laughs> I found a couple um, initiatives that are taking a bulk of my time, and now I'm feeling a little bit stretched. Um, but that's also fun. So I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I'm working on um, and ask for a little insight um, too, if anyone has some. So the first um, thing I'm working on, I'm working on um, with Jonathan Sand to develop further his uh, app called Seriously. Um, it has a lot of the features that I have been imagining since I'm working in a space that's more UI UX. And um, he's agreed to work with me on some of the features that I've been wanting to see. In addition to that, I have aligned with Winfinity, which is um, Trey and Parmjeet. Some people might recognize those names from Kiko Lab um, and another woman, Marta. And we formed a little group and we're pushing forward initiatives there. And there's a lot of stuff moving in that community. Um, and that is a community that really holds space to listen, brings experts together, but we it's really unique in that we talk about what we think is emerging and what needs to be, like what questions and what features need to be satisfied. And then we look at all the ideas and projects that are out there to decide based on all the questions that have come up, which projects are the priorities. So it's less about weaving what people are currently doing and more about listening for what needs to be made, which is just a slightly different variation on a theme. Um, and I really appreciate that approach. So we're working together on that. Um, now that I've connected with OFC and Vincent started to get connected with OFC and Charles Blass is already connected with OFC, there's some interesting meetings happening over there about wisdom repositories and connecting projects with money, with, with information, and then storing everything. So they're moving pretty fast um, because they had a platform that, um, that was uh, given to them. Um, some code, so they're re, you know, they're iterating on top of that. So it's pretty robust. What the demos that I've seen, so I'm kind of excited for what can happen there. But that's new for me. And then the last piece for me, I think, over the holidays, I'm gonna be taking some breaks from meetings and doing some real storyboarding and um, iterative work on the stuff I've been imagining in my head because I have yet to see it anywhere. And even with the people I'm working with. I keep coming back to, I think I just need to do some storyboarding so people can see. So Eric, when you were talking about, um, you know, wouldn't it be cool, you go out and you see something and then you get to download it into your own thing, the decentralized web enabling that, that kind of thing. Um, I've been imagining for a long time, the visuals that go along with that. What, what would the navigation to that kind of thing look like? And then how would it look when, when people download that? What would they see? How, you know, trying to make it really user-friendly. So I'm, I'm going to play around for a while with, um, I'm hoping Figma will really help me. If anybody knows anyone who is familiar with Figma, that would really help me if I could connect with them. Um, and, as a way to start first, just I'll pencil out the storyboards, but then hopefully put it in a format that I can, you know, have a good demo. So between Seriously and Figma, I'm hoping that I could start sharing some good demos of what this might look like and even more important, what it might enable. So how this kind of technology and this user interface will change the way we think or change the way we work together or change and give some examples of what that might look like. So that's where I'm at. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Wendy. And and I'm I'm having a moment where it's like what you just said and our previous conversations over time and so forth. If you and I gathered one or two other people who feel like the conversation I'm about, about to describe, it would make a lovely weaving the world episode, <clears throat> which is, hey, what's that problem we're looking at? And who's trying to solve it and how might it be solved and what are some creative answers for it? So if you'd like to brainstorm on that, I'm all that over fun. setting that up. Yes, I'm in. Sounds great. Um, let's go Stuart, Kevin, Julian, Mark. Uh, great, so for the last um, uh, probably close to seven years, I have been working with a group um, started by Meg Wheatley called Warriors for the Human Spirit. Essentially, it's about um, Tibetan Buddhist techniques and it's provided a great grounding for me. I never could have, I never could be doing the work that I've been doing if I was still attached to outcomes. Uh, and I think that's a, an important lesson, you know, for, for, for all of us. Otherwise, you kind of just burn yourself out, which I know would have happened um, to me. Uh, about 
six, eight months ago, I decided that I only wanted to be in conversations like this, uh, looking at the, 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 the global challenges uh, we all face because everything else is kind of moving deck chairs around the Titanic. And as a result of it, I even kind of canceled my, <laughs> sound terrible because it feels so politically incorrect, but I, I canceled my Thursday golf game so I could be in this call on, on, the, on, Thursday, on, on Thursday mornings. Um, I, I shouldn't say canceled, I rearranged it, okay. Excellent, good, good. <laughs> um, but since then, uh, it, some of you are familiar, I know we interviewed Doug, the, the Society 2045 for what the world might look like in, in 2045. And Ken Homer is, 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 is part of that group also. But they called me in uh, because they ran into a little bit of conflict. And my work has always been around conflict and, and, and collaboration. And so I helped them get an agreement together about what they were doing in terms of a vision and a, and a, and a clarity for who's doing what to get people there. And then of course, became part of that book. So that's, that's one conversation I'm in, Society 2045, uh, interviewing visionaries and they, the, the group considers itself as kind of a, uh, a clearinghouse or a, uh, um, a place where all the group, all groups doing good things in the world uh, can be coordinated or or part of. It's kind of an uh, uh, an umbrella organization, still figuring itself it figuring itself out because you know we all have pieces of a solution if there is a solution, but nobody's got nobody's got the whole big picture. Um, I've also done some work with an organization called, uh, um, oh, it, it's, it's, it's based upon the work of Robert Keegan um, out of Harvard Adult Development Theory, the, the GEN Network it's called. And so I'm, I'm bringing my work into that arena in terms of helping people facilitate effective collaborations because otherwise, you know, there can be a lot of navel gazing going on in the, in the personal development um, community. Um, I've been part of a project for 15 years that's finally getting some traction. It's called um, Becoming Thoughtful Citizens. And that may be a very, very foundational piece for, for, for all of us uh, going forward. It's just starting to get some, some real, uh, real traction. Um, Can you say a little bit more about that one? Like who's involved or what, where? Sure. Um, it was initially started by my friend, Marilee Adams, who wrote a book called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life, which has been an international bestseller. And Merrily had the idea going back to 2008 that um, a critical thing was for us to learn how to talk to each other, for, for us to learn how to, uh, I'm just, somebody sharing, okay. Um, that's me, I'm a sharing Merrily Adams and her book, sorry. <laughs> uh, that, that's me interrupt, it try, that's me trying not to interrupt you and build on what you're saying and that failed. So my apologies, I'll stop sharing. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I'd much rather look at people's faces. I found okay. it a little, a little distracting. Um, but you mentioned, you know, you asking about that, going back to Society 45, two of the, two of the major movers of that program, um, uh, or a number of the major movers, my friend um, uh, Kim Wright, uh, who's been doing great innovative work within the legal profession for the last 30 years, um, traveling all, the all around the world, trying to impact lawyers and legal systems internationally. Um, Matt Perez, um, uh, who's all about uh, self-managed organizations, uh, having developed, developed one. Um, so, thoughtful citizens. Um, multi-author book um, about how can people communicate and talk to each other well, even people that are different, which ties to, you know, my whole focus is behind all the good work everybody's doing. It's the importance of changing the way people think and interact and relate to each other as human beings. Um, without that shift in consciousness, we all know um, nothing's going to change. And if we can generate that shift in conscious, consciousness, a lot of things can change. So thoughtful citizenship is about that. We're actually starting to plan an event for July 
um, where we're going to have world cafes around the world about what it means to be a thoughtful citizen and how can more people become thoughtful citizens, uh, whatever that is. And there's a there's a, a what will be an ebook um, that I, I made some contributions to. Um, so, in addition to all of that, I'm working on a on a multi chapter piece of science fiction about. What would the world look like if we were able to fix all the things that are broken? Uh, and I've identified, you know, 35, 40 things that uh, I'm doing a one page summary of, and there's a big overview. And my, my, my wish is that it would get made into a TV series of some kind. It seems like a, a science fiction piece, um, but I'm having a lot of fun articulating what my work is about. The biggest innovation I think that I can bring, and, and Gil, thank you for asking for a little bit more information about it, agreements for results. In the late 90s, I had a book published that was endorsed by Stephen Covey called uh, Getting to Resolution, Turning Conflict into Collaboration. It wasn't the book I wanted to publish, um, but sometimes in the editorial process, editors you know, see certain things. The book that I really wanted to publish was the book of agreement. Uh, which was a follow-up book that I wrote, which is how can we at the beginning of projects get on the same page? How can we get to a shared vision? What's the conversation we need to have that really grounds collaboration, grounds collaboration? And so uh, I'm doing more and more of that work. And if anybody is interested, all right, um, I'm happy to, to talk about the, you know, what I might do for your projects. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Stuart. Thank you. Um, Kevin, I think you have to bounce at the top of the hour. So let's um, let's go, Kevin, Julian, Mark. OK, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, we discovered that we're building an operating system for economic justice, which is this, uh, you know, community led. And uh, we've got things like neighborhood investment trusts and equity funds and uh, other things. And we're discovering that pieces of them are interoperable and replicable and follow the same process. I mean, a quick example, we've got this repair fund. You know, we're in a big tourism place and uh, the Biltmore moved this neighborhood and the Biltmore gets hundreds of millions every year and um, the Shiloh neighborhood gets nothing. So the tourism authority in the Biltmore want to say, okay, we'll do a repair fund, and it'll, yes, we'll make it community directed. And it's being tried in, in Chicago and, and Indianapolis too. But anyway, to make it community directed, we need this other tool that, that one of our partners has built in Indianapolis called the Neighborhood Vitality Index. And they were able to show that the social capital in this neighborhood they thought was poor was really strong and they got them a bank to reduce the cost of mortgage finance fees by making the social. And so it's reversing redlining one neighborhood at a time. What well, we need that to make the capital that uh, tourism folks pay to the Shiloh community know what to do with it. So uh, we're building a bunch of interoperable things and starting to think about it as software because uh, it's you know built software three times before B2B niches and, and when you get reliable reliance on the next thing somebody's building uh, that you need every time you do it, uh, you know, you've got the basis of software. And, and it's not like an operating system with a vision. It's just that we need this. And there's folks also doing loss reserves and loss reserves are always nasty. And the more you pool them, the easier they are for everybody. And so, you know, we're, we're just finding places where we're going to rely on each other to build the thing that, that we're trying to build to eliminate a bit of friction. But it's, it's and then there are people who want to think about, you know, what, what is the big thing? And then there are people wanting to think about who owns this? You know, it's, it's got to be something like a data trust, like a land trust or something. I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a thing in the commons that facilitates the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it'll have money flowing into it. So, uh, from a couple of different sources uh, on a regular basis. So, and we can build really long-term uh, because we can, uh, because of the kind of capital we have. We have, we have this philanthropic uh, concessionary patient capital uh, on this donor advice fund marketplace along with giving and then some, uh, some deals that, that earn 3% uh, over the long-term. 
So anyway, it's an operating system. And, and so we're learning to, the, the metaphor seems to be working with everybody. And that much of the people see themselves as point solutions. We have only a couple or three things at the operating system level. The, the, the marketplace and donor advice fund, the repair fund sweeps in all the money. And then pooling our loss reserves seem to be the, the OS level things, whereas everybody else is agreeing they're a point solution and they need, you know, it's like in the early days when somebody was a word processing thing and somebody was a spreadsheet, and nobody had any, anything like Microsoft Office. And you, you just, uh, conversations when you're not sure how it all fits together or when it fits together uh, are pretty interesting. So that, that's what we're, that metaphor seems to be, oh, that, that's what we're doing. Everybody's going, yeah, that must be what we're doing. So I'm, I'm inviting some people who actually, you know, know something about that into this process because if you have replicable processes <clears throat> that everybody relies on, then you, you know you can turn that into software uh, coordination. So it's kind of interesting. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I put a link to a really nice uh, report on things like data trust. There is a thing called data trust. It's interesting. Oh, good. That's good to know. I, I made it up. I'm glad, I'm glad it oh, exists. No, no, it actually exists. It's a thing. And Mark Kronza and the archive probably know more about data trust than well, they don't, apparently. Okay. Not, yeah. uh, ixnay, ixnay on the us tray. Uh, not me, at least. Um, yeah, no, no. But I'm think, but I'm thinking somebody at the archives got to have ex examined that in terms of sort of legal structures for the archive, et cetera. So we can find that's out. That's a good idea. If, yeah. if somebody had a connection with somebody at the archives, uh, we sold uh, the business. I'm, I'm, so every every Friday there's a lunch, an open lunch at the archive, right, Mark? It's like anybody who knows about it can show up. I will yeah. talk about so that to, in my um, check in. Uh, so you have you have to be in town. Awesome. Um, no, uh, no. Actually, um, we're doing it over Zoom now, Kevin. And oh, I'm uh, I'm the I'm the guest speaker tomorrow. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, there's like a twenty minute. It's a, they have a twenty minute talk often. So, uh, so I think there's a there's a there might be some really nice connections there. And part of what I want to do is explain OGM, and say, hey, how do these things? How might these things sort of fit together better? Um, yeah. So there we go, uh, Mr. Cool. Kelly. Yeah, I was I was trying to get in the check in. Got to go. Did, but shall I go ahead? Uh, go right ahead. Sure. Um, so Aspen Institute has a, a request for proposal out. They are um, planning to, they're looking for ways to combat disinformation and misinformation. They are building off the work of a, a group that did a lot of work on this last year. So they have a whole long list of areas and they want you to pick, say how it is that you're responding to that area. And the, the, the product is open. It can be a policy. It can't be lobbying. It can't be, you know, we should do this, it, but it can be a policy that could be uh, executed by the executive, either at the state or federal level. And of course it can be software and uh, it could be wireframe prototype. They're gonna pick five finalists. Uh, the, the, due, the proposals are due January 10. They pick five semi-finalists. Each one gets $5,000. And I think they have a month or two to tighten up their proposal. And then the winner will be picked from those five and they get $75,000. Um, they're interested in a plan that would deliver something by the end of 2022 that includes a budget, includes potentially another funding source. So it's, it's not a rocket. It's more like a... Uh, a rocket igniter kind of thing. I mean, you got to also go and get, you know, the other parts of the rocket and put it together. There's several conversations that have already begun about this. Doug actually has an idea. I don't know if he's going to mention it, but it's, um, it's an interesting idea for uh, showing the path by which a current news item, item got created and what were the earlier uh, sources that, that led into it. There's a bunch of other ideas that are kicking around. Um, I want to talk to Mark about it at some point. I want to talk to various people. You know, we're, we're ideas are kicking around. It's not, it's not a, there's no slam dunk. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Okay. And I, I certainly am a little uh, sobered by the um, degree of specificity they want and the shortness of the timeline to deliver it. But I definitely think it's worth giving serious consideration. And, um, you know, we need it. So let's, and if we have an idea, I have parts of an idea, other people have parts of an idea. Let's see if we can uh, do something. I've spoken. 
<laughs> I love that. Um, good with which you're supposed to like exhale a big puff of smoke and pass the pipe to the next person, I think. Um, the whole misinformation, disinformation thing is like this gigantic hairball of twine. I propose, I propose we launch a vaccine initiative where we embed small microchips in everybody and then we identify who's creating mis disinformation and neutralize them with like by sending an electric shock to their chip. Does that sound good? Everybody on board? Awesome. Um, so let's go Julian Mark Pete. Uh, so, so I have a different tack of uh, check-in this week. I updated my the brain importer to recognize version 12 brains. Oh, cool. So mm -hmm. now I have to rebuild all my Neo4j databases, which will only take half a day and then also fix my visualizer, which I broke some time ago, um, then start um, building some demonstration movies to at least show because the, the real demonstrations have to be done with some kind of hardware, even as cheap as a Google Cardboard, but none of that works over a webcam, but I can at least make some movies and, and show things working. Is there a way, so I've got Google Card Cardboard at home, I've got a big brain database you could suck in. If I can be helpful in that, or as an experiment, or as your guinea pig or crash test dummy, I'm happy to. Uh, your big database is the, your brain or what? Yeah, yeah. Which you've been playing with already, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just wondering if the whole thing will break it. But. Uh, we could extract a small piece of it. We could, you know, we could try with a small, small hunk. Well, it's not like computers don't catch on fire anymore, so. That's true. Right. That's true. It's sort of a shame. It, it took a lot of the fun out of it. And then most of the time I'm dealing with a rambunctious kitty who seems really antsy this morning, so. Excellent. Um, anything else? That's it. Thank you. Uh, Good question for you, Julian, if you don't mind. When you say you're visual, you know, you're doing a visualizer on top, I don't know your work very well. Can you just say more about that? It sounds interesting. Uh, so briefly, I don't do 2D or what's called 3D graphics anymore, because what people used to is 3D graphics is actually projective 3D onto 2D. And I'm more interested in using actual 3D, the XR technologies to display information or knowledge networks. But my whole premise is based on cognitive science. So my approach is to look at how the human body works, build an API for the human cognitive system, and then build uh, software systems on top of that API that interact with the knowledge base. I love the idea that XR equals AR divided by VR. Um, so th in terms of formal language theory, I just call it dot R because it's dot mapped to any particular character. So whatever R you want to call it, then I can encompass that with dot R. So. Oh, good. Oh, good. Even even more terminology. Um, so let's go uh, Mark, Pete, Doug, Michael. Um, good morning. Um, I have been uh, um, reading a heck of a lot. Um, as as much as I can, it always is not enough. Um, but uh, I hadn't read uh, Gregory Bateson's A Sacred Unity for a decade or more, and I'm just kind of amazed at uh, how the type of thinking that like both and, but one side kind of has to be kept secret from the other in terms of how the sacred works. Um, so don't wanna really go deep on that because I can't, but um, uh, at work, um, I write code and uh, it's tough, but um, uh, little things get done and uh, hopefully uh, I improve the ability to read books online on the internet archive, but uh, I'm getting old. I turned 59 uh, last week and um, uh, I, I, I find coding incredibly difficult. <laughs> to, to uh, more difficult than when I was 25. Um, but um, I've been a part of a group of thinkers here in San Francisco. I used to have a thing called um, T4, um, the thinking about thinking things. Um, and part of a um, Memex group for about 10 years. And so on the 18th, um, 
two Saturdays from today, I'm having a uh, Memex idea mapping and intelligence augmentation uh, meetup. Um, hopefully we can put it online. I have some video support um, and I'm looking for people to talk um, about one of those notions if anyone is interested. Um, what are the notions again? Memex and what? Memex, idea mapping and intelligence augmentation. I've heard of some of those. Yeah, so um, that is uh, a struggle to actually plan and make those types of uh, um, events happen smoothly at the same time uh, working a part-time job. Um, and so yeah, I'm tired, but um, I press on. Um, that's it for me. Um, help, encourage, and certainly people who have something to say, um, uh, encouraged. Um, we can do an online meeting. Um, I look forward to Jerry's um joining um the friday lunches um tradition of the internet archive um i heard of the internet archive way you know decades before i i joined um but also came to the free friday lunches the in-person friday lunches um gosh since uh, uh yeah decades ago um, and hopefully after COVID that will start again, but now we're having um, two things before all of our meetings, um, well, two, um, the uh, Monday all hands meeting and the Friday lunch, um, we support musicians or poets and give them a stipend to show up and perform for 10 minutes before the meeting, which I think is incredibly generous and, and cool. Um, and then uh, we have, um, outside folks, um, Jerry this week, to uh, come and talk for about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, uh, look for, again, look forward to, to you know, hearing and participating in that. Um, you had your hand up, uh, Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to say, given what you're saying, reminds me, do we have a way of getting in touch with each other that I've missed? You and I specifically? Or just generally, if somebody says something interesting and you want to connect, how do we find out how to, what their email is? Simple, something as simple as that. So we, you can go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. I was going to say you can ask on the uh, OGM mailing list, which is the Google group. Uh, and then we have Mattermost channels that many but not all OGMers are in. And there's a Mattermost channel for this call called call OGM in brackets calls. Uh, and you could just ask, you know, hey, uh, Mark, are you here or whatever? You can ask there. You can also always email me or, or whatever, and I'll, I'll try to make connections. But there's lots of lots of different ways. That Mattermost is kind of the best of those. Modulo, Thanks. whether or not you like Mattermost and, cool. and yet another service. Thanks. Yeah, Doug. yet another service would be um, Vincent Arena's Trove or. Um, That's true. You could use Vincent's uh, Trove. Meet the uh, URL for that. Could you post that kindly? Uh, sure. uh, yeah, Pete will do that. And uh, Mark, I noticed you're wearing your archive t-shirt. Oh, yeah. There you go. Archive logo. Ar the archive is in an old uh, Christian. Yeah, it's the old logo, but maybe you can. Universal access to all knowledge. The knowledge. Um, it, it's, the, the building is in an old uh, Christian science church, which is really interesting. And it's Temple, it's, really? Temple, yeah, thank you. It's a really interesting space. And I have, I have a, a funny kind of interesting connection to Brewster. My ex was Brewster's public relations representative when he was with Alexa Internet, which was one of the early tool belts for the inner tubes. So remember that you could sort of install Alexa and it would go, it would follow your browser and it would tell you popularity, traffic, you know, other kinds of things about the site you were visiting. So he sold that off, I think, to AOL. Uh, way back in the day. No, not Amazon. Amazon. Amazon, that's right, which is why the device is now called Alexa. Which is why the Internet Archive has a bit of funding because he sold it for stock. Bingo. Uh, but also, I think he sold it with a proviso that as Alexa continued its crawls of the inner tubes, it had, it had to donate the data to the archive. So, and with so a he, time delay. 
with it, it was so but it was brilliant it was like hey you get to buy this thing this thing is yours thank you for so much money but one of the provisions is you need to feed this this nonprofit thing i'm starting i'm really it's one of the the the, the sneakiest and best sort of startup stories i've heard of something like this and and klaus like watched that space for for you know clever ideas for bootstrapping uh socially beneficial initiatives so and i have heard that people who have the name alexa yes um, there's an article about this in the new york times exactly are changing uh, their names changing their names because of uh machines it's screwing up the alexa space yeah and when i said the word out loud right here i looked up to see whether our device had detected it and i was like ah jeez. so i don't get this changing your name why don't you just get rid of the device because other people are teasing them yeah and they can't get rid of the other people it's just much harder in, in my house, every time someone calls for my daughter, whose name is Sarah, and goes, hey, Sarah, Siri turns on. <laughs> oh, great. That's great. Um, OK, let's go Pete, Doug, Michael. Um, thank you. I'm going to, if this works, I'm going to paste my top of mind things, and I'm going to go through them real fast Awesome. Um, in the interest of time. Uh, so I'm working with Weaving the World Garden Crew, which is David Bovel and Wendy Alford and I, and a little bit with Good Workhouse. Um, uh, Weaving the World and Garden Crew, um, uh, we're, we're craving and knowledge casting and wisdom casting, uh, things like smart cities, water, uh, water and land. Uh, and uh, something called Voicing Gaia. Some of those are, are kind of proposals. Some of those are actually happening. Uh, craving and knowledge casting and wisdom casting are kind of the same thing. Um, it's sense making around um, a recorded event, more or less. Um, uh, Jamaica and Katie at Open Futures Coalition are running something called the Interoperable Wisdom Commons, which is if you're one of the people into knowledge gardens or collaborative knowledge or yada yada um uh wouldn't it be cool if all of those things interoperated uh and if that sounds if that makes any sense to you then you want to find jamaica and get yourself invited to that group um or me or or whoever um uh i've actually got a, a small client uh working on airtable um i'm changing them from google sheets uh for their crm system to CRM and contract management system uh, over to Airtable. It's uh, cool to have a little paid project like that. Um, for uh, Good Workhouse, I'm working with uh, their project management person uh, doing project management at Airtable. Airtable is still awesome. Um, in massive wiki obsidian land, uh, we've started experimenting, especially Bill Anderson uh, and I and Mark Krenz a little bit. We're uh, experimenting with using a peer-to-peer -peer sync uh, file sync thing uh, file sync uh, application called sync thing instead of git um, and so far we kind of like it um, uh, bill and i also started building a, a little python app to do recent changes for massive wikis and obsidian and stuff like that um, this is embarrassing to say, but I think I'm actually really making money on, on liquidity mining and yield farming on Osmosis, which is on a blockchain uh, based on Cosmos. Um, uh, I don't know if I can say more about that, but whatever. Um, the federated wiki channel on Matrix um, is an interesting, it, it's interesting um, watching Ward work, Ward Cunningham, the, the guy who invented wikis, among other things. Um, uh, hangs out on Federated Wiki uh, in Matrix, and you know, there he and a few of the other folks are just working on stuff. Um, particularly if you're into mapping, right now they're dipping pretty strongly into mapping. Um, and today I learned about something called DMX, uh, which is a I don't I don't even want to say graph database, but it's um, if you're into graph graph based knowledge. Um, DMX is cool, and I'm going to post a little bit about that in Tools and Technology or Maps. Also, the name of a wrapper. I think it's not the wrapper, although I'm not sure. 
um, okay. word gets out there sometimes. Um, my reading cue is Termination Shotgun of Everything Ministry for the Future. I'm actually doing pretty poorly on all of those. I got about halfway through Termination Shock, which is the new Neil Stevenson novel. Um, and it's cool. Uh, it's about the near future when the sea has risen. Um, I kind of stalled out in the middle, which is really weird. I think it's finally getting to the good part. And I really love Neil Stevenson stuff, but I guess I've got enough other stuff going on. That's and he's usually weak on endings, not middles. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, so then after that, I, I need to get into Dawn of Everything um, uh, and Ministry for the Future. But so that's me. I have spoken. <laughs> Stacey? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. A few okay, of us so had I'm... a question. A few Go of ahead. us had a question. Hold on. I'm Doug. sorry. A few of us had a question in the chat on what is liquidity mining? Um, uh, that's a great question. Let me answer that. Let me, before I do that, let me say a top of mind thing. Um, uh, as a person who sometimes comes later um, uh, along to a recording like of a call like this, um, uh, not, I'm not pointing to anybody here in this call. I think we've all had great sound quality. But uh, one of the things I noticed one of the previous calls is that when you've got a, a, a lousy microphone um, or if there's a lot of people talking over each other, uh, it makes transcription a lot harder and it makes Pete sad. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, one of the you know, one of the digital literacy things, Zoom literacy things of the future is not only make sure that you have good light and all that kind of stuff, but make sure that you, you sound good um, and it's going to help uh, somebody in the future um, make sure that your, your words get recorded. Um, uh, so back to liquidity mining and yield farming, they're kind of the same thing. Um, this is in, uh, if you follow the, the rabbit down the hole um, you, if, and if you start up Bitcoin and then do blockchain and Ethereum and you get a little bit further, the thing after that um, is uh, something that's called decentralized finance. Um, and, they, and that's named decentralized finance in opposition to centralized finance. Uh, so in a centralized finance system, you go to a big company like Goldman Sachs or whoever and you say, hi, I'd like to uh, I'd like to borrow $100,000 at X percent uh, interest and I'll pay you back or I'm going to have some kind of weird derivative, you know, um, uh, uh, rent seeking thing. I want to join your rent seeking group so that uh, so that I make money while you make money and screw the, the planet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's centralized finance. Banking is banking and loans and derivatives and all that stuff. Um, uh, the again, following the, the rabbit down the, the hole from Bitcoin to Bitcoin, the, the, the simple thing <laughs> in this scheme, um, down to uh, what's going on with blockchains and, and uh, tokens and all that nowadays. Um, uh, the, the people, the, the developers working on that stuff have kind of re, re, uh, re-implemented centralized finance, but in a decentralized way. Um, so uh, as we speak, there are automated um, market making systems um, that run as essentially completely autonomously. Um, and uh, you can enter uh, essentially financial marketplaces uh, where you can buy and sell, you know, money futures and, um, uh, earn interest on on helping other people get loans and and um, and depending on who you listen to, uh, probably there are a bunch of uh, um, shady people laundering money, uh, you know, millions or billions of dollars of of money in there. I don't know. Um, the automated uh, market systems. Um, uh, do the same. It, it's all the same kind of operations that you would find in centralized finance, but it works autonomously over smart contracts, if that makes sense. Um, and then there's a little bit of control over the smart contracts. And even those things are governed not by um, a board of directors at Goldman Sachs. They're governed by people who have voting shares in a distributed autonomous organization. 
it's all very arcane and stuff like that. Um, because it's the early days, uh, you can, uh, so now I'm getting around to liquidity mining and yield farming. Um, uh, in the olden days with Bitcoin, what you would do is um, uh, the way you would mine value, the way you would claim a part of the value space of Bitcoin is by running your uh, computer, uh, either your CPU or your graphics processing unit for a long time super fast and you bought, would buy bigger and bigger things and, and um, use more electricity and generate more heat and carbon and stuff like that. That's the old way that you would stake a claim of the value space. The new way of staking a claim of the value space um, is by um, locking up a chunk of, of your uh, money, basically. You turn, you turn US dollars into tokens and you turn those into other tokens and you turn them, you mix them with other tokens. And finally, <laughs> uh, uh, you stake your liquidity. You say, here's you know $1,000 or $10,000 of my money that I'm just going to let you hold as a counterbalance to the the machinations of the um, of all the investment and banking stuff that's going on. So uh, that's called proof of stake rather than proof of work. Proof of work burns electricity. Proof of stake um, just uh, uh, freezes capital, basically. Um, maybe capital is the wrong word. Freezes money, really freezes value. Um, so, uh, so it is that I have a little bit of savings that I can kind of speculatively lock up uh, and then get um, amazing interest rates on. Um, uh, unbelievable interest rates. Uh, and then the, the unbelievable part is uh, you don't know whether or not there's bugs in the code. You don't know whether or not there's shady people going to like fold up their tents and just go home with your, your locked up value. You don't know if the rise and fall of the tokens are going to make it so that any interest gains that you've gotten just are wiped away um, by uh, depreciation of your tokens, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a little bit of art and a little bit of skill and a lot of luck and, um, and uh, sweat and worry. Um, uh, that that's baked into it. Well, that sounds confidence inspiring. Um, so in, I so can in make a, it sound a lot worse if, yeah, if yeah. you want. <laughs> if you want, exactly. There's plenty of stories to tell. So, so in a sense, it's an alternate illiquid savings account with really good interest rates, uh, but pretty high risk factors. It's, it's uh, yeah, if you think of a CD, um, yeah. it's, it's conceptually the same thing as a CD, except that it's a lot riskier and not insured by anything like FDIC and subject to complete loss. Um, Gil, yes, it is um, uh, just a way for them that has to have more. Yes, um, I am part of the rent seeking, you know, 0.1%. I get that. And doesn't unbelievable interest rates usually mean Ponzi? Uh, it's a really good question. Not and, that there's anything wrong with that. And <laughs> it, it, it comes up a lot. Um, uh, frankly, I don't really know where all the value comes from to drive the incredible interest rates. Um, there's, there's a difference, maybe, maybe a difference of degree rather than a difference of kind. Um, there's a, there's a, there is a, maybe another way to put it where I, where I actually do know my, uh, my P's and Q's and what, what happens. Um, startups are kind of the same thing, right? Startups are a little bit of a Ponzi scheme. Um, it's like, I, you know, me and my buddy, we're gonna put in a lot of sweat equity and max out our credit cards and buy servers and, and you know, graphic designers and programmers and stuff and develop a thing uh, that then we can sell 50% of to a VC and then they're going to sell a bunch of their stake to other VCs and the whole thing is going to expand, right? Um, I, I know from hard lived experience that being early in that game um, and producing a thing of value, it's not really a Ponzi scheme kind of, um, means that you should get incredible rewards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so now that I think about it, I have to, a lot of startups are kind of, they are Ponzi schemes um, and VCs are, you know, in the, them that has, has get more. Um, but maybe they're not, you know, there are startups that have successfully made, 
you know, useful things in the world and, and are of value and stuff like that. So it's kind of the same thing is a, you know, is a Silicon Valley startup uh, a Ponzi scheme or not? And I can say, mm, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I, it feels the same thing uh, with DeFi and yield farming. There's a real thing here. And, and the, the thing that's being built that is going to help replace centralized finance seems like a good thing in the world, um, especially if you're working on proof of stake uh, rather than proof of work. Um, proof of work is bad because it burns a lot of electricity, makes a lot of carbon. I, I have to, I have to, since we went through proof of stake, proof of work, I have to uh, do a shout out to Rob O'Keefe, another um, wonderful OGM member. Um, he's a Bitcoin maximalist, um, um, which I have a disagreement with whether that's the right thing or not, but I, I respect his opinion. Um, he also makes this, and it's a really hard argument to make, but he makes the argument that um, the, uh, uh, the, the coal and the hydrothermal and the solar energy that's getting um, utilized uh, to, to prop up Bitcoin is, not necessarily wasteful compared to all the other things that we might be doing with it. And in fact, may be a way of improving our energy systems. Um, uh, uh, so he and I tussle back and forth. I, I actually just kind of, I, I kind of dropped the link into, hey, this is a cool thing about Ethereum and how much carbon it emits, uh, how many terawatt hours it uses. Um, and he's like, and it, and it, and it caught him unaware kind of is like, Pete, is this one of those things where you're saying that proof of work is stupid and, you know, like, you know, you know, so let's compare it to Facebook or let's compare it to centralized finance or let's compare it to, you know, um, there's a trope uh, in the Bitcoin world that um, you can you can get Bitcoin maximalists in, in a tizzy just by saying proof of work sucks, you know, because it makes lots of carbon. So um, I want to kind of bookmark that as a proof of work, proof of stake thing isn't uh, like a there's, there's a lot of additional context that you need to have that discussion. You can't just say, um, however, I, all, I can also say that I just go to proof of stake. It's like, I, hey, I'm on a proof of stake work, uh, blockchain. Um, I respect the Bitcoin people and I'm just, I'm not interested in that argument. So, um, so I'm not burning a lot of carbon. I am rent seeking. And you could drop in on this entire conversation by going to the Mattermost channel named? Uh, blockchain. And do you mind putting a link to it in our chat here? Uh, I, I don't. Um, you could certainly ask more questions uh, in blockchain. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure that anybody would find it particularly interesting. Well, but, but, I, but I saw Rob's post. And I'm like, whoa, OK, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, you know, if anybody's curious, that, that would be a good place to go like, ask questions. You, and... you know, since, since I'm here, um, I, I can also say there's another trope um, about the Web3 people or the DeFi people or the Bitcoin people or the Ethereum people. It's like, you know, it, there's a couple of cartoons you, you can, I, I showed Jerry one. Um, uh, you want to screen share and show it? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, this, this well-meaning person who maybe looks a lot like me comes over and says, oh my God, this Web3 thing, it's amazing. You have to get into it. It's DeFi, it's decentralized, it's amazing, right? And everybody's like, Pete, come on, you know, um, I don't need, I do not need to see a JPEG getting sold for $69 million. Really, that's just not a thing that I need in my world right now, right? So, yes. Um, the whole Web3, decentralized, DeFi, blah, blah, blah. There's literally billions of dollars, you know, uh, up to about a trillion, a thousand billions of dollars sloshing around in this crazy marketplace. And I'll, some of that weight does warp things a little bit. I'm here to say, along with a few other people um, who are much like us, um, uh, there is real value here. There is real technology that's being built that's useful. Um, we're, we're in the early stages of kind of the equivalent of a next dot-com boom um, with Web3 and decentralization and stuff like that. There's a real pony in here. Under all the BS, there is literally, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of BS washing around too. And, and it makes an interesting interesting space. Um, uh, somebody, somebody said, you know, it's, it's kind of like we're going through the early days of the dot-com boom, except this time the money came first. 
and then we're doing um, a lot of uh, tech development. In the dot-com boom, everybody, you know, people like me were working for for little money. And then we had to figure out how money got into the system. And there's a story there about how we ended up with free things like free search and free news and all of that, that is a, a horror show to, to tell in reverse. Um, uh, so yay, the universe gave us a thing where we didn't start with free everything. Um, we're starting with paid everything um, and it's a, a different ride. But there is real value, real structural stuff, real technology that's being developed on a bunch of rent seekers dimes. Um, and it's, so the value, there is value there. Uh, Julian. So I was going to point out that the, the general rule is that the more risk you have take, the bigger the reward you get. And that does describe Silicon Valley. And it seems like uh, your liquidity mining also has a pretty high risk factor, which is why the return is greater. A Ponzi scheme would be 100% risk and 0% reward if you're not in it at the beginning. And then uh, from that, I wanted to lead into a comment about NFTs and stuff. Uh, a scenario I saw yesterday was, first off, you have to have the capital. But say you have 2 million in Ethereum, you create an NFT, sell it to yourself for 2 million. That sets the value of the NFT. You then sell it for 200,000 and you now have 2.2 million without really much work. So. <laughs> I would, I, I, I like that. I like that. And thanks for that Ponzi um, definition. That's a good one. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think that the, the NFT marketplaces aren't as stupid as you think they are. <laughs> um, not, not you, Julian, in general, but you know, people go, okay, this NFT marketplace is stupid. There are definitely stupid examples to it, but um, having been a participant in NFT marketplaces, the market actually kind of works. Um, uh, so you can get distracted by going, I don't know why somebody spent, you know, pick, pick a number that would be too much for you to spend on, on a digital stamp collecting basically you know I, I wouldn't spend a hundred I wouldn't spend a thousand dollars I wouldn't spend ten thousand I wouldn't spend 69 million dollars on that but for the person who spent it usually they know what they're doing and usually it, it wasn't a, a problem for them and usually they got value out of it um, uh, and uh, liquidity mining is better um, than that 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 nft scheme for what it's worth um, I you know the so and there's a weird thing. It's it's not actually risky. It's just that you have to know, you have to you have to get the feel for what's risky and what's not. The actual marketplace you end up is actually not that risky, and it's really weird that millions of dollars isn't flooding into this more. Um, so the let me kind of scale this for you. A uh, hundred one hundred fifty percent APR is not. Uh, that's a you know you can get one hundred fifty percent APR in yield farming pretty easily. Um, uh, so 150% APR means that uh, annually um, you would get 150%, like you put a uh, hundred bucks in and uh, you'll end up with 250 bucks. I'm doing this math on the fly. I hope that I'm not screwing this up. Um, this is the same APR rate. Like if you go to your credit credit union and say, hi, I want a, a $10,000 CD, they'll say 0.5% is what you're going to get, right? So instead of 0.5%, you can get 150%. That's like a huge number. Um, so the way that you figure out, and, and then the cool thing is, I just said that in APR, um, uh, if you change that to APY, uh, annual yield instead of annual percentage rate, um, the, the um, the uh, APY is the compound version of APR. Uh, if you take 150% and compound it daily, which is what happens, um, the rate goes up really dramatically. So literally you can end up doubling your money in like seven weeks, um, which, uh, which is really striking <laughs> um, and scary, I have to say. Insane. We have slipped past our usual 90 minutes. We have three people left in the queue. I'm happy to hang out uh, and keep going. Doug, thank you for your patience. We have Doug, Michael, and Gil. I think I'll just pass at this point. I'm sorry. Um, we'll start you. We'll start with you uh, two weeks from now when we do the next go round. Um, Michael. I'm happy to pass too. Much to say. I'm, I'm too busy with my head swimming 
um, after after each year. Um, it's all fascinating. Um, yeah, provocative. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Friend. Um, yeah, just real briefly, I'm likely to pass also, but I'll just say that, well, love the call. I'm, I'm, I find myself in a dance between structure and flow, um, experimenting with having a much more rigorous uh, framework and schedule. I was never a Marine, and I'm practicing what might that be like to live that way. Um, and alternatively, just go with the flow and follow my nose and follow my intuition at any moment where it goes. I've been in a flow cycle. I'm swinging back, I think, to a structure cycle because there are things that are just slipping. Uh, that need to unslip. A uh, big echo to Stuart about wanting to spend all my time in conversations like this, um, both ones that I've organized and ones that I find my way into. Uh, and my challenge there is my other imperative these days, which is figuring out how to monetize me. Uh, and I don't know if that looks like liquidity harvesting or something else, but um, you know, have, have a need to sustain uh, a family and medical expenses and so forth. So just being in graduate seminars all the time doesn't, I'm not sure how to map those together. So I'm exploring that. Um, the, the, the current hypothesis is to focus on um, executive coaching of a different flavor uh, and keynote speaking mostly through the web and hopefully buy some time with that to do the other more, um, um, you know, in the, in the kitchen kinds of things. And we'll see how that goes. Um, Pete, I want to talk with you more about liquidity harvesting. Stuart, I want to talk with you more about what we said we're going to talk about. Uh, awesome. So, um, since we're in overtime, I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so luckily, we don't have sudden death overtimes in OGM. That'd be embarrassing. Um, but really appreciate the conversation and our note taking and all the rest of it. So. Um, Thank you very much. Until next week, when we'll do a topic. So let's refine our topic on the Mattermost chat for this call. Oh, one, one last question. I'm sorry. Um, yes. can, can you uh, share the link to the event tomorrow, you or Mark? Um, yes. Uh, Mark, do you have it handy? I don't think I have it handy. I, it's going to take me a second. Um, Hold on. Let me see if I've got it. Uh, let's see here. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, la, 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 la. where did that okay there's that window here's the slack um uh, it's typically um uh, where is that Um, Monday, Friday lunch link, copy, and everyone paste. <laughs> B. Um, I am actually not sure how many people are are welcome um, during that, but I will ask that question today. I don't know was, what the protocol is. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, that's, that's the Zoom link. That's not the invite link, it, it, exactly. So yeah, at, that's at, the Zoom link. It starts at um, five minutes till. The, yeah, eleven fifty-five, or maybe even ten minutes till sometimes. But um, uh, I will post in um, the uh, Mattermost channel. Um, I'll ask that question immediately. Sounds great. Thank you. Because I think there'd be a, a, a few people interested from OGM. In participating now that it's, now that the zoom that's in zoom not face to face because yeah I, I i think it's okay i was hoping to uh invite um the woman whose name i always forget um from society library um uh, jamie jamie joyce. jamie joyce jimmy joyce thank you um and uh hey um everybody have a great week and cool weekend weekend thanks all oops uh quickly jerry yeah um, you want to talk about um digital objects on uh, the archive. Um, you mentioned that uh, maybe Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. Um, hold on um, a second. Let me stop the recording. Mm -hmm.